Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Cindy Bassford. I've been working with CMS and other federal agencies on large scale implementations of legislative mandates for the last 20 years. Uh, for our agenda, I'm going to talk through some relevant examples and lessons learned, and then Chance will talk you through some factors to consider from industry. But first, Chance, do you want to introduce yourself? Thanks, Cindy. Hello, all. My name is Chance. I'm a partner here at GuideHouse on the commercial side of our business, working within the life science segment. Uh, my role is working with pharmaceutical manufacturers who are the recipients of many of these legislative changes to help understand impact, prepare, and comment, and look forward to providing an industry perspective for today's call. Thank you. All right, so on this slide, I picked a few examples to highlight where GuideHouse has helped uh, departments and agencies implement successful large scale changes where I think we have some relevant examples and lessons learned. At TARP, uh, we wrote the ERM playbook, which led to billions of dollars delivered to the economy, much of which has been repaid. A key takeaway here, uh, as with any large scale legislative change, is thinking through a strong enterprise risk management program. Resources will always be limited and difficult decisions will need to be made. Having a framework to rely on to make and keep track of those critical decisions is a must given the responsibility the government has to beneficiaries and the scrutiny from third party reviews. At SBA, we were sought out again for the CARES Act to support the distribution and repayment of funds under a similar framework, which we uh, developed for this highly scrutinized effort. But here, a key takeaway was a uh, proactive strategic communication plan. We drafted papers, uh, we drafted uh, responses to a variety of stakeholders, including large media outlets, industry associations, congressional inquiries, et cetera. Um, now at HHS, in addition to what I've mentioned, uh, we found that building relationships with the GAO, OIG, congressional aides, and industry uh, through where possible proactive communications, but also prompt and accurate responses to inquiries have uh, really helped the success of the programs we were involved with, like MMA and MACRA. So here I have a few examples that more closely relate to experience and lessons learned with pharmaceutical programs. Uh, for example, helping military health administration, uh, implementing TRICARE pharmacy support. There we analyzed tens of thousands of historical pharmacy claims. We found it useful to partner this analysis with commercial expertise on drug trend usage. We needed to not only see the trends, but allow the flexibility to adjust models for variances in the population, copays, and rebates, for example. This project was also interesting as we work with providers and pharmacists to sign them up for participation, allowing us to really understand uh, their questions and concerns more intimately. Our commercial and federal practices worked collaboratively as One Health to bring this insight while being mindful to navigate any potential conflicts. Our work at FDA was a little different. It wasn't about drug pricing, but rather setting up a new center to partner with the same stakeholders CMS will be working with. Uh, we really found that bringing everyone along with us on the journey was critical. The bi-directional communication through training and workshops uh, led to better outcomes and less time spent on programmatic clearances. Lastly, uh, before I hand it over to Chance, I wanted to highlight our 340B program work that exists today in Part B. Uh, we've helped over 400 clients, some for over a decade, with the same mission of ensuring local access to affordable drug treatment for patients. 
To help providers meet this mission, we've developed and leveraged standardized tool sets, advanced analytics, and repeatable methodology that uh, proves focusing on drug pricing can improve outcomes and accessibility, especially for our rural and most vulnerable populations. With that, I will turn it over to Chance. Great, thanks, Cindy. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is talk a bit more about the industry perspective and those that are going to be impacted by the, the legislation. And there's a couple of key components that we wanna talk about first, which are the process, the inputs, and the personnel to implement this type of large scale change. The first is a clear framework, one that's defensible and objective. There's still enough ambiguity within the legislation and the rule that folks are asking, how is this really going to be implemented? So it's gonna be important that that framework exists in a way that provides transparency to stakeholders. Second, the selection criteria for which drugs will be eligible for negotiation remains fairly narrow. So we wanna understand in terms of the exclusions that exist today, whether that be those that have generics or biosimilars or don't meet a certain spend threshold, how do we seek early wins, avoid combative entities, and make sure that this is a win for all stakeholders involved? The things that we use to perform the analysis, we wanna make sure those are not confidential, that it's not black box, and it's aligned to that framework that we established early on. And finally, just ensuring credibility to the stakeholders that the individuals who are a part of the discussions and the analysis and the implementation have the requisite skills, the experience to form those relationships and create a bridge to, again, make this a successful implementation. There's also unintended consequences that we will consider as we implement and, and roll out the rule. One is there's a limitation on taking price increases greater than inflation. That may lead to a bolus of new drugs pricing at a much higher rate than they normally would have because they're unable to take those price increases over time. So it's important that we understand how does this spend uh, amortize over the horizon. Second is many pharmaceutical entities as well as their lobbying associations have said this will have a negative impact on research and development. We certainly do not want to preclude the implementation of new medicine and new advances for patients. So making sure that we understand that bias, that perspective, and we're able to definitely navigate that. And finally, is just misaligned enforcement, really understanding what are the penalties, how are they implemented, and how do we evaluate the underlying behaviors with which pharmaceuticals may use to navigate and mitigate these. And so it's important that we take these holistically into account as we think about implementation and developing the framework. There's also other factors that we want to consider, both in terms of what are our objectives, but also what can we learn from other markets. Collaboration is going to be critical here. As Cindy said, that has been a track record that we have seen critical to making these successful. So we want to make sure we're soliciting feedback, which is occurring through comment periods and through other forms, but important to continue soliciting that feedback, understanding bio and pharma and other societal positions. And finally, what are the other unbiased entities that we can leverage to make sure that folks feel like this is a, a fair and objective approach? ICER is a great example who has been tracking drug pricing and drug reform and can be instrumental in helping to make sure that all parties feel that this is fair. Second is the data that's going to be used to perform these analyses. We need to understand what information we're using. How is that collected? How is it reported? Data inherently has limitations, whether it be claims data or EMR or other reported sources. So we want to understand those limitations up front so we're prepared to handle any objection that may come from the, the participants. And as we said early on, ensuring the objectivity and transparency of the information remains critical that this does not become an exercise where, where folks don't feel like there's fair transparency in the negotiation and in the process. And finally, we can learn from international programs, whether that be Markets such as the UK that use cost effectiveness and quality adjusted life years as an objective standard measure with which you can compare multiple drugs. We can understand how innovation is rewarded. Those products that are providing significant incremental value to patients, how do we reward that innovation much like France and Germany do? Or is it about affordability? What's the total budget impact, the total cost to the healthcare system? And how do we ensure that we aren't having medications that could bankrupt a particular segment of the healthcare market, much like a Spain or an Italy does from a decentralized standpoint. So all these together are, are critical aspects for us to consider as we start to create the framework and implement the rule. Great. 
Thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, if you have any questions or want to contact us further, our contact information is on the screen. Have a great day.